Hello students, um, today we're going to be doing a little introduction to um, thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is a really interesting field. Um, we're only going to just begin to hit the surface of it. Um, by the time we finish this discussion today, we'll just, like I said, barely be scratching the surface. Um, some of the more interesting and some of the most important aspects of thermodynamics aren't even going to be covered. Um, in this chapter. You need to take a, a second semester freshman chemistry class or, you know, that deals with what we call physical chemistry or um, uh, some physics classes also cover these things too. Uh, but what we're going to be doing today is talking about why things happen. We've been talking about the phenomenon themselves, you know, why um, molecules arrange the way that they do, uh, states of matter, um, why uh, gas or, or, or the method by which gases transition into liquids and, and then they transition into solids. Um, however, we haven't really got into what's making that happen. Why can't a gas just be compressible for eternity? Why can't I just compress it all the way small? And it, why does it have to change state, for example? Um, thermodynamics is one of the things that governs this and it's an important piece of it. So let's start our discussion on thermodynamics. So one of the ways that we're going to kind of get through this is we're going to uh, do a little PowerPoint uh, presentation and I know that a lot of PowerPoints are dry and boring and I'm going to try to keep this one from being dry and boring and we're going to have a couple of videos to demonstrate some of the points that I'm making. And fortunately, this is only about 30 slides or so long. Uh, I'll be posting the, uh, the PowerPoint online. So the main thing I want you to do is basically watch the video. And with the PowerPoint, you can go ahead and make, print it out at home, make notes and whatever it is that you want to do. Um, so here we see some early history of what's been going on. And a, little bit, a lot of the, what we're going to do in the first uh, part of this lecture is review what we already know and take it to the next level. So what is thermodynamics? Uh, the science of thermodynamics was developed in the early 19th century with the initial work being performed by William Thompson. There's a picture of William Thompson right down there at the bottom of the page, who was later made a baron and renamed Lord Kelvin. He's probably one of the most important figures in scientific history, far and away. Um, the book does go into some criticisms of some of the mistakes that he is perceived to have made. However, the book then makes its own mistakes by misunderstanding why he was wrong. And I'm not going to go into it further than that, other than to say that almost every textbook I've ever read has made this mistake. Um, okay, the next bullet point here says, atomic and molecular theory of matter was not understood then. We add, we, as a matter of fact, at the time, we didn't even know about the existence of atoms. We had an idea of a smaller, of a smallest uh, piece of matter, but what, I, and when I say we don't understand, we didn't know that there were atoms, we did understand there was a smallest piece of, of, of material that you could go, beyond which you could go no smaller. However, we didn't know even the atomic structure. That wasn't developed until the 19th, or until the 20th century by a guy named Niels Bohr. Um, so invoked macroscopic ideas, in other words, things that you could see without having a microscope or having advanced electron microscopy or things like this, such as mechanical work. These are things that we do, have been doing in our class, which is work equals force times distance. Pressure, you can measure pressure. Uh, pressure is just force uh, times the area. And temperature. And of course, notice that I have NK, which is Kelvin. The foundational principles of thermodynamics are one, the conservation of energy. Two, the fact that heat flows spontaneously from hot to cold and not the other way around. Thank goodness that heat always goes from hot to cold. That cold does not encroach upon heat. That It doesn't work that way. Really, cold is the absence of kinetic energy and materials. And you're really just spreading that kinetic energy and materials from areas of high energy to areas of low energy. That's really all that's happening. It's a very straightforward phenomenon. Early on um, in thermodynamics, uh, when people were looking at these problems, they actually believed that there was a fluid that existed 
in kind of in the universe and they called this fluid the heat was a fluid it's kind of a strange idea and they called it the caloric um, which is where we get the word calorie from um, we have as we've discussed in the last couple of chapters um, the caloric is is there's no fluid out there that it's basically electromagnetic radiation that's bombarding these things and eliciting the responses the future uh, chapters that we're going to be covering is going to explain how that happens um, we're just not quite there yet so anyways here's a picture of lord kelvin looking all distinguished um not as a young man but he did actually some of his best work when he was um kind of in his youthful uh, stage of his career uh, one of the things that lord kelvin worked on was this question of whether or not there was an absolute coldest temperature you can get to we've discussed this in uh, in um uh, class a couple of times where is there is there in fact a coldest temperature and the answer is yes there is a point at which kinetic energy goes away um, basically goes to zero and Lord Kelvin had and not just him but several other people had recognized that if you're doing experiments at zero degrees which is what we see here um, and we'll describe what's going on in the slide here in a moment that if you're doing um, experiments at zero degrees which in other words right at zero celsius with pressure held constant that the volume would change by one two hundred and seventy third and it was consistent and it didn't matter if it was helium it didn't matter if it was hydrogen it didn't matter if it was oxygen it didn't matter if it was just air steam whatever it always happened well the steam of course doesn't exist at zero celsius but you get the idea all gases did this and we know that this is so from the ideal gas law. We've talked about this uh, previously. Um, and what we recognized pretty early on was if you're at zero degrees and everything compresses down to uh, zero, at absolute zero, or at zero volume, that there would be an impossibility that starts to take place, so what we would call in mathematics an, un an undefined situation. So let's go through what this slide is saying here. As the temperature of a gas changes, the volume of a gas changes. We've talked about this before. Unfortunately, and you'll see right here, this equation, PV1 equals P2V2, I inadvertently put the wrong equation in here. The proper equation is this one right over here, P1V1 over T1, because there's no temperature over here. But this is the one that I intended to actually put there. So sorry about this. You can scratch that out in your notes and just circle this one. And as you can see, the pressure, volume, and temperature are related to each other before and after a reaction. You heat something up over here, it's going to have a response over here. You change the pressure here, it's going to have a temperature or volume response over on the other side. This is all this means. At zero degrees with pressure constant, volume changes by one by one over 273 for each degree Celsius. So if you go down five degrees, then you're actually going to change the volume by five two hundred and seventy thirds, um, and this is a pretty predictable response. Absolute zero, lowest limit of temperature. In other words, if the volume keep, continues to get smaller and smaller by one hundred and two by by I'm sorry by one two hundred and seventy thirds each time, once you've gone down to negative two hundred and seventy three degrees the volume will have changed and shrunk down to the small level. This is, in fact, the, the diagram, uh, unfortunately. Oh, there's my, there's my mouse right here. Um, here we see at 100 degrees that the volume would change. This is the initial volume. That's what the 1 represents here. But it would increase by 1 273rds. That's a, that's a mouthful to say over and over again. Uh, in scenario B, if you held it at zero, the volume wouldn't change at all and stay where it is. If you dropped it down to minus, in scenario C, to minus 100 degrees Celsius, the volume would contract by 1 273rds. And of course, what I'm describing here is what if we went ahead and went down to negative 273? In theory, the volume would go to zero. We know that this can't happen. We know that this can't happen because matter, by definition, takes up space. But 
this gave us a clue for what would happen. That there must be, in fact, a point at which things literally freeze and can go no further. And this is what we define as absolute zero. And that what prevents or causes things to move beyond absolute zero and prevents them from falling before, uh, lower is this idea of internal energy. Energy at the, part, at the particle level within a substance in several forms, which when taken together are called internal energy. You take all the different energies within these particles and they basically motivate um, a complex series of reactions within each other. The internal energy of a substance is quite complicated. The simplest form are the kinetic and potential energies of the molecules, right? So we're, we're not, you know, we're kind of off in the weeds right now. We're talking about all these different energies, these things, you know, that we've been covering since Newton, but we've never really put our thumb on what that is. We'll get into that in future chapters. Hooke's Law gives us two very useful equations that we already know how to use. So this will make things easier, and I discussed these in class. Force equals kx, where k is the spring constant, x is the displacement, and energy is one-half kx squared. We will be seeing Hooke's Law again in the next section of the textbook as well, so we need to make sure we understand it. Absolutely need to understand this. Our study focuses not on the internal energy directly, because to do so requires a lot more math, and a lot deeper understanding of thermodynamics, but rather on the changes in internal energy of a substance, right? Heat is a change or a flow of energy from place to place. And this is probably one of the more important aspects that you need to understand right up front. Work is clearly related to energy as they share the same units, and those units are joules. We have been dealing with joules since the very beginning, when we got into work equaling force times distance. And then we also noticed that those units of joules were coming into place with energy. So it, there's a reason why, and it's because they're, they're closely related phenomena. You can actually put energy to work. All right, well, with all that background stuff kind of out of the way, let's get right into what it is that we're here to study today. The first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is a restatement of the law of conservation of energy. This is to be completely expected. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can change form. You can go from kinetic energy to potential energy. It could be converted from physical uh, motion into, into um, a chemical energy uh, and vice versa. Um, for example, when you fire a gun, you're basically burning the gunpowder. The gunpowder explodes, and that creates kinetic energy, or it should say create. It's transferred into kinetic energy, which then motivates the, the, the bullet out of the gun and towards its target. This law states that the energy added to a system transforms to an equal amount of some other form of energy. So this can also be applied to thermodynamics. And in this case, if you take heat, you add it to a system, so heat added to a system is going to equal the increase in the internal energy plus work done by the system. Now remember where I was saying that energy and work are correlated? Well here, we see that they're in fact directly related through the first law of thermodynamics. That internal energy of something is very similar to the work done by a system. And in fact, you could get the idea that if you add heat to water, and water turns to steam, it's just it's not just the fact that you have the internal energy of the steam, but you can use that steam to, say, power a piston as it expands out. Or, uh, and, and in a sense, as you expand that piston, you're basically doing work. So this is an important thing to understand. And we can take advantage of this in many of our technologies. So the first law of thermodynamics uh, we're still continuing along. Another implication, instead of adding heat, if we do mechanical work on a system, we can expect an increase in internal en energy, i.e. temperature rise. So if I do work, I can, can, I can make energy out of it. I can take two sticks and rub them together, or in the examples here, rubbing your hands makes them warmer. 
you know, just take your hand and just do this. We've all done it in all our lives. And in rubbing your hands, you're warming yourself up. You're doing, you're taking internal energy, you're taking food in, which is chemical energy, you're breaking it down, and you're using that chemical energy to cause the cells to, to move in a physiological way, to rub your hands together. That's work, and that work then releases or, or creates friction, and that friction releases the temperature or the, uh, the heat. Um, a gentleman by Joule, uh, Joule is actually the guy that the energy uh, unit is named after. He created an apparatus, and the apparatus basically is, is that as you drop weights, and you can see it here in the drawing, oops, right back, that you drop a weight on this crank, this is obviously going to drop down this direction. It's going to spin this paddle inside here. And it, they found that as the paddle spun from this weight dropping, that the water would actually warm up. And the reason why the water actually warms up, and Jewel didn't actually understand this, is that there's internal friction within the water. You get turbulence in the water. The water then warms up with this, from this energy source. Okay. Um, and then that heat basically warms the water. And you can measure it with, with a thermometer. You can see they have a thermometer located right here. Um, and then you just simply reset it. You know, you go and do work on the system by resetting the weights, and it does it again. All right. So let's actually do a quick check to make sure we have an understanding of what is happening here. Work done on a system. For example, compressing air in a tire pump. You're out there, and you're pressing air into a tire pump. The temperature of the system is going to do what? Is it going to A, increase, B, decrease, remain unchanged, or is no longer evident? So I encourage you to pause the video, think about it for a moment, and we'll give you the answer here in a moment. So I'm assuming you paused the video and you've come up with some type of solution. Um, and here it is. Work done, when work is done on a system, for example, compressing air in a tire pump, the temperature of the system increases. And the explanation is simply this. In accord, in accord with the first law of thermodynamics, work input increases the energy of the system. Remember that nice little equation that I had down below, right? If you're going to compress P1, if P1 goes down, those P1 over here is on the top. It's in the numerator on this side. So it's going to have an inverse relationship with temperature on this side. So if you make P1 go down, that's going to push T2 up. That's the reason why. But the first law of thermodynamics makes it very clear that this is going to happen. The equations also predict this as well. This, this equation is actually derived from thermodynamic relationships. All right. So good. I'm sure you've got that one right. That allows us to move on to the next part of the lecture. And we've got to talk about adiabatic processes. Adiabatic is one of those words that can be a mouthful. You'll hear people pronounce it different ways. Um, but let's go back to what we've been talking about and seeing how we could simplify things. And one of the things that we could do is we can assume adiabatic conditions. So the first bullet point we have here, in the equation P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2, it can become difficult to analyze changes in P, V, or T. So it is nice to restrict or hold constant one of the variables to simplify things. Of these, T is the most difficult to control because heat tends to flow in or out of the system readily. Um, it, it turns out that heat is not always restricted. It's very, if you have a good insulator, even then the heat is still going to begin to flow out. So this is something that is uh, an important problem. Um, if we didn't have, have insulation, for example, refrigerators would be a lot more expensive to operate because it takes a lot more energy, as we're going to talk about heat pumps and things like this coming on, to maintain them. Um, temperature or heat, uh, or temperature as a result of heat, 
flow is something that tends to leak out of the system. And we need to know how to kind of get these measurements uh, precise. Pressure is easy to measure. Volume is easy to measure. Temperature is leaky. It's very, very difficult in some cases. Compressing or expanding a gas while no heat enters or leaves the system is an adiabatic process. So in other words, you want to do this process where you take a piston and you ram them together or, or, or you pull things apart, for example, on a bicycle pump, but you don't want any of the heat energy to flow in or out of the system. You want it to all be contained therein. And we can, in fact, accomplish these things over relatively short periods of time. Um, and we can do this uh, according to the two uh, bullet points we have here on the screen. Unfortunately, oh, there's my, there's my mouse. Uh, by thermally insulating a system from its, in, its surroundings, like in a refrigerator, or putting a, uh, a warming jacket around a, a uh, uh, hot water heater, or two, performing the process so rapidly that the heat has no time to enter. Okay, so you do something so fast, say under cold conditions, that the heat never has a chance to get into the system. Okay, so you can do these things, for example, in, a, in an ice room or something like this, or you know, a large refrigerating unit. Okay, so by definition, an adiabatic process has no heat added to the system. So the heat added to the system is going to be zero. So the increase or decrease in the internal energy has to be equal to the work done on or by the system. For example, when we compress air using a bicycle pump, when we do work on the system, we heat the air up which is to say to increase its internal energy. Okay, so when you go out and do work, you're heating it up, but all that is external. Okay, you're putting work into the system. But the internal energy has never changed from its original standpoint. So let's check some understanding on this. Think about this a little bit. Blow air on your hand first with your mouth wide open like this, then with puckered lips. In which case is the air coming out of your mouth cooler? Or, so is it when your mouth is wide open, when your lips are puckered, is it equally cool in both cases? Or does it depend on who does the experiment? I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to pause the video, do the experiment yourself at home, and let me know what you come up with. Well, actually, don't let me know, but test yourself. Okay, I'm going to assume that you've just paused the video, and I'm about to give you the solution. Blow air on your hand first with your mouth wide open, then, the puckered, then with puckered lips, in which case is the air coming out of your mouth cooler? And, of course, the answer is when your lips are puckered. Okay, B should have been your answer. The explanation is when you pucker your lips, like this, the air expands as it comes out. Air expanding adiabatically does work on the surroundings, right? As you're pushing air out, it's expanding and it's pushing the atmosphere out of the way. It's doing work. So it loses internal energy, which makes it cooler. All right? Alternatively, you'll notice that when you do puckered lips, you're basically blowing things through a small hole. So things are coming out under relatively high pressure. So if, remember, if you increase the pressure, I've lost my pointer here, unfortunately. There it is. If I increase the pressure, I decrease the temperature. Remember, these are inversely related. P1 is inversely related to T2. So this is high pressure decreases the temperature, in addition to the fact that we're losing a lot of this internal energy to the work it does on the atmosphere. It's even more so if you take a straw, right? Blow through a straw, and it's definitely cold when it comes out the other side. Whereas when you go like this, it's basically reflecting your body temperature because you're not compressing anything. All right, so good. I'm sure you got that one right. So 
is there any applications that we can use for this? You know, it's great that we can do these things. We can motive, we can manipulate the temperature of things. We can heat things up. But is there any application for this? Well, we've been kind of going through some of the early applications in fire science, and the same things are applied here. Okay, but I think probably a better way to explain this is by going through the meteorological um, applications. And your textbook does a very good job of going through this as well. Um, there's a little extra that I'm going to add to it from the textbook, or uh, that the textbook doesn't have, but nonetheless, here it is. So thermodynamics is useful to meteorologists when analyzing weather. One manifestation of the first law of thermodynamics can be expressed as air temperature rises as heat is added or as pressure is increased. So this was something that I put up in an earlier lecture, is this relationship. And basically this is what they're saying in this darkened, or I'm sorry, this emboldened area, is that pressure times volume is proportional to T. Okay. Um, heat may be added as incoming solar radiation, radiation back from Earth, moisture condensation. We've talked about moisture condensation being a heat source, actually, right? As you transition from fa uh, across phases. And of course, contact with ground. The ground is generally going to be warmer than the air above it. So we're, we're seeing this relationship of all these sources of heat into our environment. Uh, in the adiabatic form, when no heat is added, the first law of thermodynamics, and it says be expressed, it says it can be expressed as air temperature rises or falls as pressure increases or decreases. Adiabatic processes in the atmosphere occur in large parts of the air called parcels. So when we think of bodies of, of, of the atmosphere, when I say air bodies moving around, these parcels basically isolate themselves. So anything that is inside of here is not communicating with anything up at the North Pole or down at the equator, right? Anything that is right above, uh, say for example, Hawaii or California or New York is going to be in a, in a large circulation cell. And what's in the middle and near and even into the edge is going to be different than what's going to be in the next cell. So they're relatively isolated. Okay, so parcels are large enough that outside air doesn't appreciably mix with the air inside them. And they behave as, as if they are enclosed in giant tissue-like garment bags. <laughs> in other words, there is leakage that goes between the cells, but not a lot. Okay, we can model them this way. Not so much that, in other words, that the cells don't matter. Uh, we can model these parcels as closed systems. It doesn't mean that we can always do so, but we can try here. So a closed system means that it's not interacting with anything outside. It's completely inside itself, within this, as they describe, light tissue, or tissue light garment bag. And so this would be an example, a Hadley, cell, uh, a Hadley circulation cell. Uh, Hawaii, for example, is subject to one of these. And essentially, you have moist, warm air rising up here at the center because the equator is warm. There's a lot of evaporation, but that evaporation as the, as, the, uh, as the cells rise, because warm air tends to rise, results in cloud formation and rain. We get tropical rainforests, and then that eventually cools off, and the cycle, the air condenses, it gets heavier and sinks back to the ground, it cycles back into the process, it warms again once it gets near the earth. And the consequence of the rising air is very profound. There's in fact a very neat relationship that plays out as air rises. As parcels of air rise, they expand lower they experience, I'm sorry, lower pressure, and so they expand. So, obviously, as you write, raise air masses up, they're going to get larger. The expanding air cools down. The expanding air cools down 10 degrees Celsius for every one kilometer rise in altitude. Air continues to rise and expand as long as it has a higher temperature than its surroundings. Okay. So as long as it continues to rise and expand, it means that it has a higher temperature than its surroundings. It's going to continue to go up until it reaches that level. When it 
when it gets cooler than the, than the surroundings, it sinks. We just described that actually in the previous slide. And this is how convection cells form in the atmosphere and control worldwide weather and ocean circulation. The oceans are circulating in convection cells that are being largely motivated by wind and air currents um, in the atmosphere. And then there's deep ocean circulation that is based upon a very similar uh, principle of density flows and things like this. So what do we see here? This is an important point to take away from this. The expanding air cools down. And how much? 10 degrees Celsius for every kilometer rise in altitude. And we can see this expressed right here. The ground here is 25 degrees Celsius. And it's moved up one kilometer. And look, it's dropped 10 degrees. Now it's two kilometers, dropped another 10 degrees. And so on, until it gets to four kilometers of altitude. And now it is at negative 15 degrees. So as parcels of air rise over a mountain, so in other words, we're going to take this moist, warm air, we're going to ramp it over a mountain, which is going to make it go into a higher altitude. The air cools and water condenses, forming clouds and precipitation. As the parcels of air drop down the other side, they experience higher pressure and heat up. So when we look here, basically it drops down the other side, it heats up because it begins to get under greater pressure. And as it, incidentally, as it goes over this mountain, it tends to drain out a lot of that moisture that is in that original warm air. Okay, so the air is actually dry on the other side for the most part. And these dry, warm areas typically form dry regions. This is where our deserts tend to actually form. So the, a good example that they give is the, is the Chinook wind that descends from the Rockies into the Great Plains. Okay, so as the the uh, uh, air comes out of California and over the Rocky Mountains. Basically, it rains over the Western Rockies, and then when it gets by, by the time it gets to the Great Plains, the air is warm, but it's relatively dry, which is why you don't have those uh, amazing uh, forests that exist up in the Sierras and Rockies. This can also be applied to Hawaii. Uh, one of my this is kind of one of the more interesting photos. I the, pulled this straight off of Google Earth. But this is one of the great photos that you can look at and figure out exactly what's going on with the microclimates in Hawaii. There's tons of microclimates here. Um, here we see the three cities. Um, got a whole bunch of you guys that are watching the video living in the Hilo area. Uh, the other side is Kailua. And of course, the uh, Keala Kekua is located right over here in this vicinity. And then where I'm actually recording this is in Waimea. This is where I live. So these are the three principal areas here. And take a moment to look at this photo and notice that when you're looking at it, you see these nice lush green areas over in the Hilo side. And these green areas extend all along this coast, but you don't see too many of these green areas in the Kailua area. And the reason is completely because of the processes we've just been describing. Let's go ahead and delineate that zone. So right here we see, on one side we see green, one side we don't see green. It's more of a deserty type area over here. Waimea, as you can notice, is, goes right through the middle of it. Um, and one of the reasons why this is happening is because we have prevailing winds that come across this direction. Now the island itself has these series of volcanoes that are basically behaving like this hill. So let's come back over here. So these prevailing winds come in. They're warm, it's moist air, it's coming from the Hilo side, generally towards Kailua on the other side. And as a consequence, we get a wet zone over here, which is usually wet and warm, and on the other side of it's dry and warm. We actually get a cold zone up here right along this ridge. And Waimea, of course, this is the reason why you have the quote-unquote dry side and wet side of Waimea. And it's all based upon simple thermodynamic explanations. 
If the prevailing wind was coming from a different direction, you'd see your forests, uh, your rainforest, located in completely different areas. This zone over here exists. There's a little green area over here in Kailua. The reason why this little green strip exists is sometimes you'll have momentary winds that go the opposite direction, but it's not as nearly as common. Overwhelmingly, the, the rain and the wind come from the northeast towards the southwest. So let's check your understanding really quick. If a parcel of dry air initially at 10 degrees Celsius at ground level expands adiabatically while flowing upwards alongside a mountain a vertical distance of 5 kilometers, what will its temperature be? So I encourage you to go ahead and pause the video. If you need to, rewind the video back a little bit. We have actually gone over how to solve this problem in detail and then come back for the solution. Okay, so I'm going to assume you've gone ahead and paused the video and come up with a solution. And here it is. If a parcel of dry air initially at 10 degrees Celsius at ground level expands adiabatically while flowing upward alongside a mountain at a vertical distance of 5 kilometers, well, what will its temperature be? And the answer is ne uh, negative 40 degrees Celsius. And the explanation is that air cools at the rate of 10 degrees Celsius for every kilometer. So if it rises 5 kilometers, it will cool by 50 degrees. So you take 10 degrees Celsius minus 50 degrees Celsius, that gives you a negative 40 degrees Celsius. Okay? You can also begin to understand why, there's several reasons, but why it's cold on top of mountains versus down at sea level. All right, so we've talked about the first law of thermodynamics kind of to death. Um, but let's get into some other really cool stuff. The second law of thermodynamics is an extremely important principle because it, it is what makes our lives so comfortable in so many ways. Everything from why internal combustion engines work, why automobiles operate the way they do, air conditioning, heating units, all kinds of engines. Okay. So for example, in summer, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I haven't even, I haven't even said the law yet. The law says, Heat itself never spontaneously flows from a cold object to a hot substance. So in other words, nothing cold automatically gives up what little heat it has to something that's hot. So if I have an ice cube, an ice cube is at zero degrees Celsius, it still has heat, right? It's still, it's still at 273 degrees Kelvin. But it's not an instantly going to transfer that to heat that's something that is 373 degrees Kelvin. If anything, the 373 is going to flow towards the ice cube, which is at 273. This is an important idea to keep in mind because this is the principle that dictates all of these engines. For example, in summer, heat flows from the, out, the hot outside air into the cooler interior, right? The heat is always flowing towards the colder. In winter, heat flows from the warm inside to the cold exterior. So whenever somebody opens up the door and lets all the heat out, you're literally trying to heat up the entire atmosphere. Probably not the most economical way to approach that problem. So keep your, you know, your window shutters closed. Um, heat can flow from cold to hot only when work is done on the system or by adding energy from another source. For example, heat pumps or air conditioners. You can, in fact, take the heat out of an ice cube and put it into someplace else. Remember, there's 273 degrees Kelvin of temperature there. So there's heat, and the heat can flow, but it's not going to flow by itself. You have to put work into the system to make that happen. So a heat engine is, a dev is any device that converts internal energy into mechanical work. Okay, This is basically like I was describing, a steam piston or a gasoline engine burning fuel is taking that internal energy and putting it into mechanical work. The basic idea behind a heat engine is that mechanical work can be obtained only when heat flows from a high temperature to a to low temperature and from a I'm sorry a high temperature to a low temperature. In other words, heat tries to fill in the valleys. It wants to come in and fill in areas of low temperature. In every heat engine, 
only some of the heat can be transferred into work. And this is important because it's impossible to get 100% efficiency. Some of that heat is going to be lost. I'm going to talk about a heat engine really quick. So every heat engine has two things. A reservoir of heat at a high temperature, which we call Q hot. Q is the variable that is used to describe heat. This is, the, I believe, the first time I've introduced this. And then it has a sink, or what we call a heat sink, at lower temperature, which is at Q cold. Okay, and there's a basic diagram, and this is from out of your book, where you have a zone of high temperature, which is usually caused by either you expand, or, or I'm sorry, you heat something up. For example, you have a fire, or you have steam, or something like that that's coming into the area. And it basically, you're taking advantage of the fact that it's trying to go to an area of low temperature. So you create what they call a thermal gradient. This stuff is flowing in this direction. And you can siphon some of that off to do work. Okay. Remember, a joule of energy and a joule of work are equivalent units. This is important. So we're going to, you'll notice that in the PowerPoint, I've embedded right here a YouTube video. Um, you can either just type it in from the video, but I'm going to actually go ahead and bring that up right now, and we're going to watch it right here in this presentation. And now, heat engines and not heat engines. For a heat engine, you need, this is going to be a schematic of four different types of things. There's the heat engine. And the heat engine has a, uh, well, it's got a hot reservoir here. And that's at some temperature T hot. As we've seen before, the heat engine is dumping heat into a cold reservoir. At some temperature T cold. And the purpose of a heat engine is to generate this right here. This will be the heat leaving the hot reservoir. And then there'll be some heat dumped into the cold reservoir. This is a waste because <clears throat> this is not coming out as work. And I'm just going to leave this here as this infinite cold thing. And this here is this infinite hot thing. But uh, the point is the balance between these two comes out as work. And we know that the work that's done by this heat engine is probably going to be, what do we say? We've got to have conservation of energy, right? The engine's not storing up any energy. Um, and so we're going to say QH is W plus QC. So then I could solve this for W and say, well, it's just QH, the heat leaving the hot reservoir, minus the heat being wasted into the cold reservoir. So that's the work there. And we had an equation for efficiency also. What did we say for the efficiency of this thing? We said that that efficiency will be, oh, shoot. I guess it's, well, efficiency is defined as um, work out over work in, because if you work out, you win. And the work that we have to put in, work that we have to put in, is the heat from the hot reservoir. And the work that we get out <coughs> is this actual, excuse me, <coughs> usable heat. So this could be. Um, this could be coming out as mechanical work, or it could be coming out as electrical work, or what have you. But at any rate, we were able to go on with this and say that, that because the work is QH uh, minus QC uh, divided by QH, this is the same thing as 1 minus, oh, QC, shoot. 1 minus QC over QH. And then Lord Kelvin helped us make that decision that that was the same thing as 1 minus the temperature of the cold reservoir divided by the temperature of the hot reservoir. So the efficiency cannot be 100%. And if we just take, let's just do this, because you probably haven't done it, you slackers. If I say TC, the cold reservoir might be the outside temperature. I don't know. What do you want that to be? 300 Kelvin? OK. And T hot might be inside of a gasoline engine. And boy, I'm just going to make this number up offhand. Let's say that that is 1,000 Kelvin. You can look that up and make fun of me in the comments if you want. But I'm going to find the efficiency. The efficiency of this engine would be 1 minus 300 Kelvin over 1 thousand Kelvin and that is three tenths so this efficiency might be as big as 0.7 but unless you have a cold reservoir of zero and we'll see in the third law of thermodynamics that that's not really going to work for you you're not going to have an efficiency of one 
So, ooh, what do you think? Is the efficiency more dependent on the temperature of the cold reservoir or the temperature of the hot reservoir? You think about that for a little bit. We want to consider not engines. And not engines are sort of exactly the opposite of engines. And I'm going to, on this page, discuss fridges. This is a refrigerator. Where did that D come from when they shortened it to fridge? Nobody knows. Maybe it's like the P in hamster that's not really there. So you need a hot reservoir. And you need, uh, at some temperature, T hot. And you need to have some heat. Oh, this is interesting. Well, you're going to actually have heat going into the hot reservoir, which we'll call QH. And that's not the purpose. You're not trying to heat up the hot reservoir. But let's say that down here, there's also some heat leaving a cold reservoir. Guess what? Heat does not want to leave a cold reservoir. So this is the cold reservoir. In order to make the heat leave the cold reservoir unwillingly, this is strictly speaking coming right up to the second law of thermodynamics and saying, no, I don't want to do that. Because the second law of thermodynamics says the heat will never spontaneously flow from a cold thing to a hot thing. But if you do work, ah, if you do work on the system, that would be this work that we're doing right here, you can get heat to flow from cold to hot. And that's what a refrigerator does. It pumps heat from a cold reservoir at some temperature T cold to a hot reservoir at some temperature T hot. So for the case of a refrigerator, this might be inside the fridge. And this might be outside the fridge. And so, if you then uh, consider, well, there's a very, 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 very similar thing that many people have in their houses to a refrigerator. And I'll do that in brown, because it's so similar. This sucker is called an air conditioner, and it makes you feel nice in the winter. Some people say, some people say that air conditioners have made humans weak and dependent on the cushy surroundings in order to survive. But an air conditioner requires a hot reservoir at some temperature T hot. And it requires some heat probably going into that hot reservoir. That's where you're just dumping all your extra heat. And then there's going to be a smaller heat, but it's flowing into the air conditioner. And it's leaving a cold reservoir. And that is where your table is. This is your house. And this is outside. And you know the second law of thermodynamics says that you can't, what does it say? It says something about you can't spontaneously have heat flow from cold to hot, so you know that there's some work coming in here. And we can say that the work, oh, maybe it's electrical power. Maybe you're getting some, uh, maybe that work is it uh, it's, could be the power, which is I times V. It could be I times V times time, maybe. Who knows? Um, and the same thing with the refrigerator. You plug in the refrigerator, and suddenly it is sucking heat from a cold reservoir and dumping it into a hot reservoir, which is not what spontaneously happens, because it is, in fact, increasing the order in the room. So I'll start talking about order now, because that's going to be our next video. But we know that this is increasing the separation in temperature between cold and hot if we're dumping heat to scooping it out of the cold reservoir and dumping it in the hot reservoir. And that's not what the universe likes to do spontaneously. The universe likes everything to be the same. The universe is like a giant lawnmower and the first ones to pop up are the first ones that are mowed down. I'm just kidding. The universe is actually pretty cool. But <clears throat> the heat so pump the reason why I is cut it off right there is he goes into exactly the same scenario and does the same math again for a heat pump, which is just basically the opposite of what uh, a refrigerator does is it basically pulls uh, uh, heat it forces heat to flow from a cold area into a hot area which is basically how you would heat your home what he's saying is is that with just a little bit of work into the system as we can see here on this heat pump we're to reverse these arrows and go the opposite direction um, a little bit of work into the system can draw a lot a lot of heat from a cold area up into a high temperature area just by reversing these things okay that is something that allows a refrigerator
to draw tremendous um, uh, kind of environmental subsidy to heating your ham or to heating your, your potato salad or whatever it is you have in your refrigerator. Um, beyond that, which would be if you just did it all electrical power, which means, you know, it's possible that maybe only um, one third of that one low of that low temperature is actually due to electrical power. The rest of it is actually being drawn from your house. That's a pretty cool thing. Um, if we didn't have that opportunity of using um, the second law of thermodynamics, we wouldn't be able to do these things. So uh, I just I think that's a really cool uh a feature. But every heat engine basically cap gathers heat from the reservoir at high temperature, converts some of this heat into a mechanical work, and then expels the rest of the heat to the sink at lower temperature. It's basically what it's doing. It's just allowing the flow of heat one direction towards the other, and then we basically we're pulling some of that off to do work. Okay. Another really cool thing is um, that we kind of have to keep in mind is, is that the totally efficiency of a system and he went through this a little bit but there's actually a simpler way to approach this thing and that the ideal efficiency of a heat engine was determined by this guy named Carnot. Uh, Carnot is um, uh, an important, he's basically the, the father of heat engines. Um, you can't study heat engines without uh, studying Carnot. And as a matter of fact he was also one of the ones, uh, first people to come up with a system of thermodynamics by which Lord Kelvin later on uh, did extensive work on this and became famous for. But Carnot was one of the people that made some of the, the great observations that have pushed our uh, mechanical age forward and in a lot of ways brought about the uh, Industrial Revolution. Um, anyway, so it depends upon the temperature of the hot reservoir and the cold sink. So the ideal efficiency is just the t difference between the, t hot, uh, the hot temperature and the cold temperature divided by the hot temperature. And we always do this in Kelvin, where T hot and T cold are in Kelvin. Always in Kelvin, right? If you start thinking in Celsius, you're going to wind up off the rails. So, um, but you can see that if you want a really large efficiency, okay, in real heat engines, the efficiency is actually less than ideal due to friction. So it's very difficult to get ideal efficiency uh, at levels of 1. So let's, let's do a kind of plug and chug type problem. What is the ideal efficiency of a heat engine that is operating between a hot reservoir at a temperature of 400 Kelvin and a cold sink at a temperature of 300 Kelvin? And I'll give you a hint. That equation right there, this is a plug and chug. T hot minus T cold over T hot. Go ahead and do that really quick and we'll give you the answer in a moment. Okay, I'm going to assume that you pause the video and that you've got your own solution. And this is basically how you work through it. Um, the answer would have been A. So what is the ideal efficiency of a heat engine that is operating between a hot reservoir at a temperature of 400 Kelvin and a cold sink at a temperature of 300 Kelvin? The answer is one-fourth. And you can see very directly that you just basically plug and chug this information right in. T hot is 400, T cold is 300, and we find that it's 1 minus 300 or divided by 400, which is equal to a quarter. Very straightforward. Okay. So I'm sure you got that one correct, and if you did, it's because uh, you're, you're getting this information. Now, it does turn out that not all heat engines require gases or liquids to operate. Ordinarily, the, what we've been seeing over and over has been a um, really interesting uh, flow of heat through by, by exploiting some of the properties of gases and liquids. But there's these really great engines called nitinol engines. And we're going to watch a quick video on nitinol engines. Um, and I hope you find this interesting. This giant complex of buildings overlooking San Francisco Bay is the Lawrence Laboratory at Berkeley. Some of the world's most advanced research in theoretical and practical physics is being done here. For some years now, a small group of scientists attached to the laboratories have been investigating this, a curious metal called nitinol. It has certain anomalous properties not yet fully understood or explained. It's caused considerable interest, it has generated some controversy, 
And it now seems that in a world searching for new sources of energy, it may have profound consequences. Research began here in a small laboratory workshop seven years ago when it was discovered that nitinol had apparently unique properties. The head of the laboratories was Nobel Prize winning physicist Professor Edwin McMillan. Can you explain what it is we're going to see? Well, this is a piece of nitinol which was made in the shape of a coil spring. And the property of nitinol is that it, uh, wants, when it's hot, it wants to get back to the shape it was when it was made. When it's cold, it's quite relaxed and will take any shape. This is now cold, and you see I can uh, take it and stretch it out. So it's made in the shape. It was shape. made in the shape that I showed you first. And now, it, now it's cold, I can stretch it. Here I have a glass of hot water, and if I just pour the hot water on, on this thing, there we are. Good as new. <laughs> In the cool state, it's relaxed and floppy. In the heated state, it remembers its former state. That's why you say it has a memory. So if you make the thing, if you make this piece of wire so it's straight when you made it, then when it's hot, it wants to straighten out. When it's cold, it's just as floppy as a wet noodle, you know. You can, if you take one of these things and put it in hot, cold water into it in your hand, it's like a wet noodle when it's cold. When it's hot, it straightens out very suddenly. That's quite, it's quite strong stuff. In fact, nitinol, a nickel-titanium alloy, can spring back with a force of 55 tons a square inch. The actual phenomenon itself is not yet fully understood. An engineer at the laboratory's Ridgeway Banks set out to build an engine to harness this. In a small workshop across from his office, he designed and built a wheel with nitinol loops hanging from the spokes. He calculated that if he filled a container with cold water and another with hot water, the loops of nitinol moving from one bath to the other would bend, then spring back, and that the sudden spring of the nitinol in the hot water would drive the wheel around, thus becoming the world's first solid-state heat engine. He was right. This simple crankshaft wheel first began spinning one morning in November 1973 at the Lawrence Laboratories Berkeley, marking the first time that heat had been converted directly into mechanical energy. Ridgeway Banks rigged up a solar heater on the laboratory roof to keep the water warm enough to drive the engine and let it run to see if there would be any sign of fatigue in the nitinol wires. After 23 million revolutions, he found that the wheel was running stronger. No one is quite sure why this is happening. Professor McMillan reported the nitinol phenomenon in 1974 at a special meeting of Nobel Prize winning scientists in Germany. We'll talk with Professor McMillan about this in our next science report. This gets better and better. It doesn't wear out. And we'll talk with the inventor of the first nitinol engine, Ridgeway Banks. And a metallurgist who has a long background in this attended a talk that I gave at MIT years ago, and, and I was trying in a sort of stumbling way to relate this to uh, other solid-state things that I thought might uh, tie in here. And, and he said, don't wonder where it comes from. He said, it's a gift from God. Just accept it. Use it. Don't worry about what's going on. Lawrence laboratory physicist Dr. Harry Heckman was there when the wheel first span round. He remembers his reaction. I'll be damned. <laughs> oh, sure, I mean, there it goes. You know, Ridge, uh, you've done it again. And actually, the, the, the mechanisms uh, that he did innovation to make, make the wheel go and the uh, kinematics of, of the wheel is... is it almost looks like it's perpetual motion. And Professor Elizabeth Rauscher, a nuclear physicist studying the crystals of nitinol, speculates on why nitinol behaves the way it does. Another Ridgeway's been trying to look at some of the magnetic properties, some of the ferromagnetic properties that might occur in nitinol. These are experiments that really need to be done to give us some clues as to what's going on. And we'll talk with Stuart Brand, editor of Whole Earth Catalog, who first drew attention to nitinol in his publication Coevolution Quarterly. This is a real case of news being so 
original that the mind, just the social mindset is taking a while to catch up with it. It's not, Night and All was not predictable from anything else going on at the time. It really was a complete flash. We'll talk with Professor Daniel Cole, who's investigating ways of using night and all engines to harness temperature differences in the ocean and geothermal springs to tap waste heat lost in most industrial processes, and most immediately, a solar-heated night and all irrigation pump. What's particularly attractive about night and all and that a night and all prime mover in that circumstance is that the solar collector has the job only of maintaining about a 20 degree cent 20 centigrade degree difference uh, in temperature. We'll talk with Professor McMillan about a new machine, another invention of Bridgeway Banks, which many believe heralds a completely new energy technology. The, the new machine depends on stretching of the wire, the absolutely longitudinal stretch. And that is a, basically a more efficient uh, mechanical motion. It is important that people are working on these things, you know. If it's used as a basis of a, a heat engine, of course, you need it in a much entire different scale of production from what it's made now. Uh, fortunately, the materials in which... It, My name's John Ambrose from Riverhead, Long Island. ...very abundant elements, so there's no, no question of rarity of materials. And it's not hard to make, but somebody just has to do it. The thing about this machine which is important to me is that it's possible to scale this design up efficiently. You simply add more night and all and you get more power out for the, uh, as long as you put enough hot water into it. So this is the first machine that I've personally had anything to do with that could be scaled up to kilowatts or even conceivably megawatts of power. Research into night and all heat engines began quietly several years ago with strange devices like this, developed by McDonnell Douglas Aircraft Corporation. Others involved in night and all heat engine research include the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the United States Navy, General Motors. Research is also underway in England, Germany, Japan, the Soviet Union, and China. Night and all can be trained with a double memory to recur to a predetermined shape. In a warm airflow, the branches of this night and all plate curve out. The force of this transformation has been measured as high as 55 tons a square inch. And in trained night and all, a cold airflow will cause a reverse reaction. And in some devices, the effect gets stronger with repetition. No one knows why or how far this will develop. But by 1974, some of the researchers working on these devices, a number of which are still classified, were saying in unpublished private and government research papers that night and all could provide a new means of energy conversion that might have considerable long-term implications. With the sudden advent in the mid-1970s of the worldwide energy crisis, the Department of Energy here in Washington, D.C. began looking for new sources of energy. And in 1978, the Department of Energy, in association with the United States Navy, convened the world's first international conference on nitinol heat engines. It was here at the Navy's Ordnance Laboratories, just outside Washington, D.C., that nitinol was originally produced as part of a little publicized program of metallurgical research for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. The Navy has now produced a special report for the Department of Energy on nitinol heat engines based on their research here at the Ordnance Laboratories Nitinol Technology Center. CNN has learned that the report will recommend the development of nitinol heat engines as a means of helping relieve United States dependence on imported oil. Uh, we see nitinol engines as a real potential for the future. We have done some calculations which show that nitinol is very viable in terms of using waste heat or uh, low temperature heat, which is the largest available source of heat in the United States. Since the energy to run the engines is in effect free, as it's waste heat, you don't have to use oil or anything or any other fuel, it's the cost of installation that's important. We ran some calculations here which suggest that if we can produce night and all at $200 or so a pound, which is within reason, we feel, 
that you can make heat engines, and these are extrapolated figures, bear in mind, that you can make a heat engine that will recover its own cost if you can run it for 24 hours a day within two years, year and a half, perhaps. After that, all the energy you get out of it is for free. It's free. And that's the driving force behind a nitinol engine. At the World Bank in Washington, D.C., they've been watching the research into nitinol. Their program is headed by Dr. Mitwally. I asked him about the Navy's latest figures. If it's true uh, that it can pay for itself in two years, I would say that's very encouraging. But I would like to see that first. If it looked as though nitinol, in fact, was going to uh, take off, as it were, as, a, as an energy source or as, a, as an energy uh, converter, would you then uh, choose a particular nation and, and attempt to see what could be done with nitinol in, in some large scale? To start with, if we can have it on its own or if we can mix it with solar energy and uh, the end use would be irrigation uh, pumping, uh, we would be very much interested in the very near future to have something done. And not necessarily in one nation, it could be in many nations in the developing world. At the United States Department of Energy in Washington, which sponsored the conference, the Nitinol Research Program is headed by Marvin Gunn. Uh, it was, to my estimation, a very successful conference. The proceedings have not been published yet, but they are eminently available. Uh, I do know that the proceedings have been put together, and when it comes out, it will represent a very, I think, complete compendium of night and all state of the art. We went forth with a lot of optimism, you know, that, well, while we'll learn a lot, we won't necessarily decide that we've conquered the world and, and, and found something that was going to solve all of our problems, but it was, we thought it was interesting enough and it was feasible enough to look at. It's, it's something brand new and it's, it's intriguing. You know, it, as you say, there's very little known about it, so we can just think of so many ways of finding out more about it. You know. Do you foresee finally something like a, a night and all economy uh, in, in certain parts of the world? I'm not sure what the numbers are in the, the availability of nickel and titanium, and certainly the, the manufacturing capability at this point. Uh, but I wouldn't want to go that far to think that night and all would dominate. In effect, I guess what we consider ourselves now is that we're on a petroleum economy, and, <laughs> and we're trying to find ways of getting away from that. Uh, I, I see it contributing as a, a component of, you know, or one of the ways of displacing petroleum as a, as a primary energy source. From a preliminary copy of the report, CNN has learned that the United States Navy has told the Department of Energy that the development of night and all heat engines would clearly serve the national interest by helping reduce petroleum energy dependence. The report also includes some startling figures suggesting night and all heat engines producing power at an estimated $600 a kilowatt are substantially cheaper than both nuclear power and photovoltaic cells. Well, meanwhile, in addition to the release of this report on night and all heat engines, which will become available imminently from the government printing office in Washington, Morning, and it features a lightweight and sleek design made up simply of the several hundred scientific papers that have been published on night and all, all over the world. And of course, some of the material is unpublished. There are now reports that in at least one laboratory in the United States, they have produced, but not yet published details of, a kind of super nitinol, a nitinol vastly more powerful than the material we have been looking at. Well, however that may be, it seems clear that the nitinol story has just begun. Kevin Sanders, Cable News Network, Science Report. So that's kind of one of the more interesting ways that you can generate electricity uh, using a nitinol uh, heat engine. Uh, basically, again, taking advantage of a cold zone and a hot zone and then alternating this metal across it and taking advantage of the physical effects that occur in the metal itself. Um, perhaps the Big Island of Hawaii might be a place that, you know, solar-powered mechanical energy could be produced uh, or even electrical energy um, using night and all engines. You know, there's tons of waste heat that could be used. Uh, to take advantage of this type of technology. All right, so there's that, and I hope that you found that uh, little, that short uh, video interesting. So we're going to finish up here. Uh, we have a couple last slides. And basically, 
Um, the second law of thermodynamics has an interesting consequence, and it's this, that in natural processes, high quality energy tends to transform into lower quality energy, or as many people like to describe it as order tends to disorder. So processes in nature moving from disorder to order do not occur without external uh, assistance. Um, things tend to just kind of fall apart and energy becomes less usable the more you have the more you consume it. You have to put work into the situation in order to order it better. Um, and this is something that organisms do well. We'll describe this a little bit. The measure of the amount of disorder in a system is called entropy. So entropy is important and and it's one of the more uh, challenging concepts to kind of internalize because we don't deal with entropy uh, on a human scale all that often. Um, but we can think of it in terms of an increase in disorder. So this might be a kind of a better way to, to, to kind of think of it, at least in the initial stages. It's not exactly uh, accurate, but it's close enough. So if disorder increases, then entropy increases, right? They're making the argument that basically they're roughly synonymous. Um, but in a thermodynamic sense. Entropy can decrease if work is put into the system. For example, living organisms take in food or extract energy from their surroundings and become more organized, right? So here I have a, a pack of, uh, of seeds uh, for growing corn. And obviously, the plant is going to have to put work in by taking solar energy and nutrients and assembling it all. It takes tremendous energy, and that work is being done by the plant to be able to grow. So in other words, in any natural processes, there exists an inherent tendency towards the dissipation of useful energy. If that plant dies, it starts to fall apart, right? It immediately starts to fall apart. So the reason why after uh, organisms die, they don't continue to grow, they don't continue to, to prosper, because the work is no longer being put in to maintain the situation. So you'll notice down below it says here, and when I say down below, I mean this area, it says it's probably better to think of changes in entropy as a result in heat in a system per unit of temperature. Okay, and so the math is this, right? Entropy, by the way, gets the symbol S that we have up here. And so the changes in entropy is really the better way to think of it, how things change. Right? And it's the, it's the sum of the change in heat divided by the temperature, given, excuse me, given in units of Kelvin. Or those of you that are uh, taking a little bit of calculus in your life, you'll actually recognize this relationship as being essentially the same thing. Um, don't worry, this nomenclature over here is perfectly fine for understanding at least the units of it, which are joules over Kelvin, right? Whoops. Joules over Kelvin. Joules is going to be heat. Kelvin is the temperature. Okay? So let's check our understanding. This is pretty straightforward, right? Your locker gets messier each week. In this case, the entropy of your locker has, has it increased? Has it be decreased? Is it hanging steady or non-existent? If you need a moment, you can pause it. But we'll just go ahead and give the answer right now. But the answer is pretty obvious. It's increasing, right? That's how we're kind of defining entropy in this case. So if your locker became more organized each week, then entropy would decrease in proportion to the effort expended. So if it got cleaner, you have to put in work. If you don't put in the work, it will continue to get messier. Right? If you don't clean your house, the entropy of your house increases, which is to say it becomes more disordered. Things go crazy on you. All right? So we're constantly having to clean our house. We don't have to go and, and clean. Uh, there's, there's not, actually no way to kind of think of this as you don't go out and dirty your house with the attempt, in an attempt to try to make it cleaner because by dirtying your house, it doesn't automatically get cleaner. But by cleaning your house, you can expect it to get dirtier. So entropy has this interesting thing of always moving one direction. So the net entropy in the universe is continually increasing, right? You don't dirty your house in the hopes that it's going to spontaneously clean itself. 
it, you clean your house with the understanding that it's going to get dirtier. Dust is going to fall. People are going to come in, take off their shoes, things like this. We say net because there are some regions in which energy is actually being organized and concentrated. We use work, right? We take work, we apply it to what it is that we're doing, and we solve the problem. But we're taking that energy from somewhere else, right? I'm eating, if I eat a, a salad, and that salad then gives me the energy to go and clean my house, I'm bringing that in to the system from external sources, right? And again, this occurs in living organisms, which survive by concentrating and organizing energy from food sources. Energy must be transformed in the living system to support life. When it isn't, the organism soon dies and tends towards disorder, right? We decay, we fall apart. The second law of thermodynamics is a probabilistic statement, which is to say, given enough time, even the most improbable states may occur. Entropy may sometimes decrease. For example, the ha remember, so when we talk about entropy increasing or decreasing, entropy usually is in a continually increasing state. In other words, things are always getting uh, disordered, but it can momentarily order. There's nothing in any of the, of the physics that says that it can't. And this is an interesting idea, for example. For example, the haphazard motions of air molecules could momentarily become harmonious in a corner of the room. We take it for granted that air is all around us all the time and that these things are bouncing all around. What if they all have to start bouncing and they all go to the same spot and congregate in one spot of the room at one moment? It can happen. The physics allows it to happen. We just don't observe it. But maybe giving an infinite amount of time, it may eventually occur. It may occur several times. It's just not observed on Earth. So these situations are possible. But they're not probable, and thank goodness the Earth doesn't, or the the atmosphere doesn't suddenly congregate at some point in the upper atmosphere for a period of time. But that's not to say that the physics disallows it. It's completely permissible. It's just not probable, right? The probability of that occurring is uh, infinitesimally small. So, anyways, I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me, um, and we'll see you soon.